That was the classic Dag Nasty. Before that, we had Flanders 72. We had Sex Dream. That's a band, not what I was doing, just so you know. Uh, we had a little uh, Down by Law. That's a great version of Bright Green Globe, a uh, little live in session album that they have. We did uh, Swing and Utters, uh, The Shekels, and we started things off with The Putts and Laser the, Blast. The, the Putts. More The. I know you love bands that name uh, Putts. <laughs> um, so uh, we are joined now uh, by um, Amy and Steve from Die Wolf Publishing, correct? Correct. D Wolf, Die Wolf. Oh, D Wolf. Okay. See, I already messed it up. I told you, man, That's my right. brain is not. Dude, not, it don't it don't matter. I'm Whatever your regional person, dialect I'm is. Not an afternoon person. <laughs> it, it's great if you got die wolf because then you have the German and the Italian. Exactly. Ah, see, so there you go. There you go. So um, talk a little bit about Stephen Amy, what they do. They have a great publishing house. They do all independent books, would you call oh, it? Yeah. Books, right? Absolutely. And you basically do rock and, and music. That's your forte, right? Yeah. All the yeah, nonfiction music or, or music sort of subculture related books, yeah. And uh, I, I think, you know, you, you have that DIY mentality that we so covet. In Absolutely. Our circle. And, uh, you know, so some of the books you, you, you've done has been the, the City Gardens uh, book. Uh, give me the full title again. It's No... No slam dancing, no stage diving, no spikes, yes. and oral history, oral history. of New Jersey's yes. Yes. legendary. What I, what I legendary. love about the book is, for me, was being able to walk down that tunnel of so many shows that I went to, and the little facts that you've given about them makes me, you know, kind of remember those times. But I think... And, and especially in the book, I think the interviews that you guys were able to get really is what sets it, because now it's a firsthand experience of the show from that artist, you know. Um, talk a little bit about the interview process and, and how that went. Um, well, one of my favorite, I, I was first introduced to the oral history format of books, oddly enough, uh, for a biography about Edie Sedgwick. And I, and I never saw anything like it before. And then, of course, Legs McNeil came out with Please Kill Me, <clears throat> one of my all-time favorite books. It was an oral history. And I'm like, why isn't every book written like this? I just <laughs> love the first hand accounts, people contradicting each other, people calling each other names. Um, and then I started down this path of doing the oral history of City Gardens, um, which I never would have completed without Steve. Nah. My angel sent from heaven. Meh. Nah. <laughs> one more. And, one more. Uh, I think and, both my and, wife and my, my, my mother would disagree with Amy, but <laughs> God bless her for saying so. Um, and so, yeah, it, it was, I mean, getting all those interviews, transcribing them, it, it was really, really hard and time consuming. And I think that that's why you don't see more or oral histories. It's just really yeah. hard. How Rather than just interviewing people and writing a narrative. How long did it take you to... <laughs> um, How many decades? I had met Steve. It was, it was probably 10, 12 years. Really? Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. Amy, yeah. Amy had done this really incredible uh, groundwork with getting it started by the time she and I had met, which is a whole other story in and of itself. One of the one one thing I wanted to comment on going back to the, the last thing as far as uh, getting people, we got really lucky because there was such a wealth of material out there. First of all, you're not dealing with one specific scene, so you're you're crossing all kinds of genre, genres. And because City Gardens was such a big place that stood for so long, I mean, we had over. 10 years worth of shows to go through. I mean, theoretically, that could have been like a 5,000 page book if we literally tried to cover every detail. So we got very lucky. There wasn't a whole lot of like super deep digging research we had to do. We found a lot of people and a lot of everybody who went through there at some point, it, it made an impression on their lives. So they were real happy to talk to us. They were real supportive of what we were doing. So 
if it wasn't for that and if it weren't for you know internet slash social media i don't think that book could have been done wow yeah the um i i know we we talked a little bit about that interview process how much of them that carried over into the documentary the 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 movie not much go ahead no i was gonna say not too much um by the time uh, Steve Tazi had started the documentary. Uh, we were pretty much done with the book, so there really wasn't much crossover. Okay. So, so we just sort of helped him, right. okay. yeah, go, go back and then sort of uh, get in touch with people. Um, there were there were a couple of really cool things that did happen, like symbiotically. Like I know we had been trying to to chase down Jello Biafra forever for an interview, and Jello is very cool. But one thing he always stipulates is. I want to be the very last interview you do. Contact me when you're just about done because you got to figure the dude gets hit up 8,000 times a day about, oh, I got this documentary and, you know, how many of these things fall apart. Yeah. So we had been chasing him down. You know, we got to a point where, okay, we're done. But then it was a point of, you know, either meeting up with him. Jello doesn't do a lot of internet stuff. So it wasn't like we could just do a Q&A internet. And it turned out because Steve Tazi worked primarily out of Manhattan, Jello was going to be there at a certain time, and it would have worked out great um, to get him on camera. So that was one ex- one experience where both really helped one another. Like I worked real close with Steve, getting Jello coordinated. I think Amy was the first person to reach out to, him, and it everything just kind of bolstered each other. That's why you know we came together with Tazi. That gave us. That we got real, we worked really close with another genius, uh, Ken Salerno, yeah. which was was incredible for both projects. I mean, neither project could exist without Ken Salerno. That's you know first and foremost. And then Pete Tabbitt from from Vision yeah. was a big part of the documentary. And Pete had helped us out when we were first starting. Uh, he was one of the earlier interviews that we did, and just. Knowing him, he helped us, you know, contact people here, you know. So all of us, you know, it was like a five, six person crew. And it just really, I think it really beefed up both projects. It really worked out great. And Ken's work, for those who don't know, Ken Salerno, a fantastic uh, photographer. Um, and, you know, the, the his, I think you can almost make a photographic history book. Oh, just, oh, yeah. Just the stuff yeah. he's done alone. I mean, it, it, he always managed to be in the best spot, the best time. I, I think, and I went to school for photography, so I have that that importance of that. The, the, the photo, to me, tells so much of the story. Yeah. And being in a lot of those shows, I could see that I'm at the front of that story, and with Ken, I'm at the back of that story. Yep really just gels together for just some fantastic memories for me. You know what's re- you know how Ken got it, if you want to call it quote unquote his style. You know where he learned photography? He was drafted into Vietnam and they just stuck a camera in his hand and said you're a, a war time. Really? that's the story he's, he's told me. Oh. Wow. All those all those punk rock, you know, you know Ken I think really started subculture wise. Uh, he's big in surfing. Yeah. Huge surfer, yeah. uh, skateboarding for years. His stuff was in the early, like early Thrasher magazine. You know, I actually like- met him. I actually met him that way through uh, my friend uh, Derek Rinaldi. If you know, yeah. oh, De- Derek, I love Derek. So De- De- Derek. Derek was actually my my best man at my first wedding. Derek and oh. I. Were so, Rock on. and that's how I met Ken. And then I, I started hanging out with them. And then I started hanging out with the guys in Vision and Dave and, and Pete and, and Ivo. And you know. I, and talking to Ken then was a great education for me because I was able to ask a lot of technical questions. Awesome. Over beers and stuff. And, and, and it was, it, it, he's a really, really, really awesome guy. If you ever get to meet him, down to earth. Absolutely. Uh, and I just can't say enough about his work. And, and yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, I could, I could, that could be a whole nother book, you know. I think, I think the, the story too is, if I remember correctly, and if I, and if I'm misquoting, I do apologize. Right, like Ken, you know, is, is a, a a guy from the '60s. His music was yeah. like the grateful. He only got into going to shows uh, because of his daughter, and he kind of like really was digging what was going on, and decided to start yeah. 
bring, so he was like, you know, he's a whole different generation from me. Yeah. And here's this guy who, before I met, like long before I met him, I knew him through his work. I, you know, you always saw his pictures. You know, if, if you were in this tri-state area and as far as California, you know, all across the country. Yeah, yeah. It is, it's, it's, he's, he's an awesome guy. And if you can, anyone listening, go check him out. I'm sure you can find Absolutely. some of his stuff, you know. Um, so another thing I really enjoyed is, is listen, you, the, the content that you have, but also the fact that you have it on your website. I was able to find the first show I was ever at, <laughs> which was awesome. So it was 85. I think it was October 13th of 85. It was the Dickies and the Dead Milkmen. Nice. That was my first time. Ever nice. Um, and then, you know, I, I just, you know, I was that Sunday kid at all the matinee shows and, you know, um, VFW. <laughs> but, but, you know, yeah. what I, yeah, VFWs. But, uh, you know, what I think was really great about that t- is, is, is the, the part that you gave to Randy and how important he was. Absolutely. Two city gardens, you know, absolutely. Because let's face it, Tut was not, he was not that. No, no. I mean, Tut yeah, was he wasn't connected to that kind of music at all. Yeah. He, so he liked blues and old rock and roll stuff, you know, you know, like, uh, Bo Diddley and some of those other things. Those were those were touch shows. That was what he was into. But yeah, and I think maybe the earliest days of the club were a little bit more, maybe a little bit more tut involved. I, I don't know. You would know. Yeah. Uh, but once Randy came on and and, and really started uh, cultivating this thing, I, I think that's where you know, as an East Coast kid, all right, I'm either going to go to CBGBs, I'm going to take that long ass ride, <laughs> and into the city. Uh, maybe I'll get lucky with a show or two at Maxwell's every once in a while, but really it was I'm 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 going into City Gardens. I never went over into Philly because most times they would just be at City Gardens anyway. Yeah, exactly. and Philly was notorious for we you know we had places that you know they'd operate they'd have like two shows and then boom the and whole then, thing. yeah exactly you yeah. know the place yeah. is gone yeah we had a couple of places that were mainstays that stuck around for a while but again nothing you know city gardens 14 years of the same guy booking shows that's amazing is amazing in, in that, that world of music okay. yep and it's you know and what's funny is if you kind of watched it you know, when the 90s came, the early 90s came along and, and all this sort of whatever you want to call it, alternative guitar based rock music really blew up. The person, one of the people that probably should have benefited the most kind of that was theoretically the downfall of his job because it just was so much so fast. It's it's a weird kind of way things played out as far as history goes. Yeah. yeah. But you dedicated, you know, a good chunk of that to him. And I really appreciated that because I think most people didn't realize yeah. the driving force behind the club and how important it was. Um, well, I mean, without him, there, there really, I mean, there would have been a city garden, obviously, because he didn't own it. But without yeah. him, it would not have been anywhere close to the... Exactly. No, no. And, and, and I, I don't think a club like that can't exist anymore. No. Nah. You know, because, you know, you, th- you think of the touring bands that came through. You'd have shows with four or five top billers, and, and you're paying 15 bucks a show. Yeah. How many times do you sit out online and bum a dollar for saying, man, can I get a dollar to get in? I don't have enough. Right. <laughs> well, plus, yeah. you know, all the things that, that live music now has to compete with, it's impossible. Like, yeah. 90% of the people aren't going to – leave their house and I mean even pre you know play right aren't gonna leave their house to go see a show because eh they can watch it on YouTube tomorrow. You yeah know what I mean yeah yeah so there's that there's so many different factors of just why you couldn't do those things then today. No. But there's also a lot of like really cool shit that you can do today that we could have never done. Right. Oh yeah there. exactly so. it's, it's a balance you know definitely a trade off yeah Yep. It's it's for, for 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 folks like us, it's just a huge, you know, it's such a heartfelt thing. Yeah. The, the, the time and effort we put in this stuff. Right. That has now been so it's and, easy, but a click. And for someone like me who was there to experience it, now that ties me into how important it is, you know, it, you know, it, it means a lot. It's it's my youth. Absolutely. It's yeah. that is my my upbringing. That's you know. It's as much as a part of a family 
it's my own family, you know, right. I spent so much time there, you know, and those friendships you make yeah. a lot of us, those friendships, you know, are still to this day. We all Listen, know. I, I it's it was such an unusual i remember one time i unfortunately i got i got jumped i got into a fight with an ex-girlfriend her boyfriend jumped me from behind and i go to the ground i'm getting kicked i look up and it's steve brown kicking me <laughs> the following week hey john how you doing i'm like steve what the fuck dude yeah he's like what i'm like you i was you were kicking me he's like i saw someone on the ground so i started kicking i'm like yeah but it was me well that's why you know? he kicked you it was i was you. like come on man you know <laughs> God damn it, dude. Watch what you're doing, you know? Yeah, he just started kicking me, you know? Uh, I, I saw him a couple years ago at a friend's birthday party. Did you kick him back? No, I didn't. No, you don't mess with Steve. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, listen. It's not a person you want to kick no. back unless you really, really have to. You, yes, yes. I yeah. don't even want to ask him uh, impolitely, why'd you kick me? You know? Exactly. You no, know, uh, Steve, it was me. I'm sorry. You know. Uh, Pardon me, sir. Yes, sir. sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But uh, do you guys feel yeah. like, uh, like we were talking about, you know, today's culture versus, you know, old school culture. So, you know, back in the day, you had the scenes, you had, well, zines, uh, you know, the do-it-yourself attitude. You know, you had the tape traders, you, you know, you put your bill up and stuff. Uh, yep. And like you said, you know, fans were so loyal to each other. You know, they just, they toured in the same circles and stuff like that. Um and like you said, I don't think today a club like that could survive, but I just don't think the scenes are the same. You know, now, no. like, uh, you know, Finn McKinty, he's on uh, he's on YouTube. He does, a, a it's called a punk rock MBA. He does this whole thing. But he was saying how he feels like TikTok is taking over. Like all these, all these kids that have access to computers and things like that who are just making yeah. music. It all sucks, but <laughs> unfortunately, you don't have the diehard bands. You don't have the garage bands. You know, you don't have people cultivating and playing instruments and going out there and, and, and handing out flyers to shows and, and tape traders. All your shit's available to stream online. You know, everything's on Spotify. Yeah. Everything's here. Every I mean, so it's a double-edged sword. You're getting your music out there a lot easier, but... I, you know, I just don't see the loyalty to bands and scenes and that type right. of thing anymore. Well, I mean, to me, the two big things there, are the one you touched on, there's the internet now. So if you were a freak or you felt like a misfit or you liked weird music, there was no internet for you to go to and find fellow travelers. You actually had to right. leave your house and go someplace and and try to forge friendships. And that's why those friendships lasted. I mean, I'm, I'm really not friends with anybody I went to high school with. But I am friends with a whole boatload of people I went to City Gardens with. Yeah. And yeah. now that you have Reddit and you can find some subreddit on the same weird niche thing that you like, why bother? And to yeah. me, the other one is back then you did not have the clear ch channels and the live nation and everything else. That And there, those places, you know, those corporations are taking over even small clubs now. Yeah. You know, they're just monopolizing everything. So yeah. a club the size of City Gardens that had that capacity, no corporate sponsorship, nothing yeah. I, that, that you, you couldn't even have that now. The insurance so, alone would bury it. Right. Yeah, yeah. And and I think the, the, the price of that the bands are receiving now is yeah. so high. Yeah. You have to be able to, to get a certain number of entries just to, cover, just to cover the rider. You know, you, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, a small mid-sized club like that is just – you know, and, and I think also what's happening is now you got a lot of the owners or the bookers, they got one band that's coming through, whoever they are, maybe like a, just a mediocre touring band, and all the openers, they're saying, listen, you got you to gotta pay. You got to sell tickets to play. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. Back then it was the club cultivated the music. Yep. Now it's the music is cultivating the club. Because you had so, so few sources of music before the club could hold that. Back then, like, DJs held all the power, too. Yeah, it, exactly. Whether it was, you know, their playlist for Modern Rock Night or whether they were hip-hop or whatever, you, nobody was hearing most of this, uh, you know, quote-unquote underground music other right. than through human means. That's where the power was. With Again, with the internet, everything shifted. Power shifted. Some ways good, some ways bad. Artists have a lot more power now over their content, over control. Right. Artists have learned, you know, the, the, the pitfalls of bad contracts, of yeah. things of that nature. But at the same time, 
they've lost this whole circuit that we had yeah. that could consistently for, for, you know, over a decade, close to two, maybe three decades, could sustain itself at, at, at small venues, at medium-sized venues, and even, you know, larger theater-sized venues. So it kind of went along. One of the things that I noticed over the, well, I guess it's been like 20 years now, but one thing you see, especially with more extreme music, is the proliferation of festivals. And yeah. that's one way that they've kind of combated this. Okay, you don't get to see every band over the course of the years they tour. How about one weekend? You can throw them all together, get all your friends. And for people like us, you know, we're the age that we might have young children that are going to shows. It ain't like what we went through. It's sort of like a nice, safe environment for them to go see some of the most brutal bands, which is, you know, again, a trade off. Yeah. It's very cool but they don't experience the danger of, you know, going through the hood to a show of knife fights in a pit, things of that nature. So yeah. pick your poison, good or bad. And the thing is with the price points of tickets now, Oh yeah. You know, it's $75 to see a, you know, a headline yeah. band, but you know, to your point about the festivals, I'll gladly pay a hundred bucks to see, you know, maybe it's a weekend show, right? So you, you get, you know, 20 bands on a Saturday and 20 bands on a Sunday I'll gladly pay that because See, like, exactly you're seeing, you know, maybe four or five bands that you love and then you're seeing 12 bands I've never heard of. And now yeah. you're a fan, you know, yeah. so, I mean, I, I do a metal show on Mondays and same thing, you know, I love my Slayers. I love that type of stuff, but I try and find all sorts of new genres of, of, of metal, you know, sure. metalcore and deathcore and all that stuff. So I, I try and uh, go to those, fe well, I mean, there's no festivals right now, but <laughs> well, yeah. So like Ozfest, all those types of things. I always went to those and, and found new bands and things like that. So yeah. Plus, we we have to remember too. There is it, it may be small. I mean, I can't really guess at the size of, it, but there is definitely a punk hardcore metal underground mm. that is very similar to to what we did as far as they reject everything everything mainstream and they really you know yeah. i know people that will do zines now and they'll do it cut and paste on a on a xerox machine right. rather than use the internet because that's and that's there's always going to be that as, and as that's great because yeah. it's it's kind of you know we grew up with that yeah. environment that's exactly up, you know? exactly so for us, and i think i think that's always that's always going to continue just like there's always going to be some form of rebellious type underground music because kids are going to be pissed off for time long after we're gone so i don't really worry about it. yes it's going to change it has to change it right. can't be the same shit so yeah. yeah you know um and you know you know back real quick i forgot about the calendar that was it was great for me to be able oh to yeah the first show i actually also found the last show so it's the only thing I actually remember doing for the first time and the last time. So <laughs> my, my last show was uh, Afghan Wigs. It was the day uh, Kurt Cobain died. I was at that show. Yes. Yeah. And that was the yeah. last the last time I went. After that, I was at college and in and out, and I just mm. kind of drifted off. You that know? was definitely one of the last shows that I was at, if not the last. I'd have to go back and look, you know, now yeah. that you mentioned yeah. that. That was the last Another show. thing I got to point out, too, all the credit for that uh, – calendar goes to amy's hard work oh, going. yeah that's a lot oh, of work. She, did, she was done with that before i even met her really wow tell them what yeah. you went through man yeah <laughs> how'd you get all that information Ooh. so uh big shout out to the good folks at the aquarian weekly or East oh yeah Walker. okay uh, they let me go back into their i'm putting air quotes around archives <laughs> uh, it's basically a, a storage room with all the old issues in yeah, it I call, I call them keepers right here in my closet <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so I went back there and it took me two solid days. I went back there and just went through every issue wow. um, looking for the advertisement, looking for the City Gardens ad. Wow. And, you know, I had a stack of papers, like blank calendar sheets for every year and just going through and writing in every band. Um, but yeah, just paging through uh, every issue of ECU. Talk about it. Yeah, that's incredible. How long did it take? Two days, you said it took two days? Yeah, two solid days. I, I went up there and just, I was there from yeah. like early 10 till five, two days. Wow, away. that's a lot. Yeah, we're thinking two days. Oh, that doesn't seem like, that's actually a lot. From 10 o'clock to two days, that's a lot of, 
looking through magazines. Uh, exactly. Uh, um, yeah. So. Um, and then I just want to say one experience, and it's something that you know the, the famous Milo Descendants show. Okay. Yes. Um, the greatest weekend of music in my life. I'm going to tell you why. So Friday night, I went to Maxwell's to see Sugar. They were it was their first tour. That uh, that, that album had just come out. Wow. So I go Friday night, I see Bob and, and Sugar. Saturday, I was seeing all in uh, New York, hmm. down by law opening, and uh, Chad lost his voice during that set. So okay. I was like, I don't, you know, Dave Smalley came out and sang a couple of songs. So it was down by law was the opener. So Sunday night when I got to see the garden, I was like, I don't know how the hell they're going to pull this off, you know. So when all that buzz came around that, that Milo was going to sing and everyone started in the crowd hearing it, when they came out and um, uh, 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 Stefan Egerton had did some mastering work on, on, on one of my band's albums, so I, I talked to him about this. One thing, when Milo came out, and I don't know if it's been recorded at all, if there's a house recording of it, he came out and he said, Chad is sick, therefore I sing. <laughs> And in his tone, you know, that monotone voice of his, it was just perfect. <laughs> and they and they opened with Sour Grapes. Yeah. And just to hear that beginning guitar part, you know, him come out and say that, and then the, that guitar part, it was just like, that room was... Exploded, yeah. And that was electric. I had never felt a show like <clears throat> that before. That room went bananas. Mm -hmm. And there was an energy. And that was before that was before cell phones. People right. were lined up outside, <laughs> outside. to use the pay phone. I was like, yeah. yeah, uh it was amazing. Uh and uh and, and and I think because you did talk with Milo about that in, in the book. Yeah, it's right? in the book. Yeah. And uh, you know, yeah, so his recollection is is really cool, but it's it doesn't give the energy that we in the crowd felt, you know? right? So that's that kind of goes back to one of the things that Amy and I learned doing the book. It was cool to interview, you know, people in the bands and the people that you admired, but when you came down to it, because you weren't talking, we weren't asking them questions about their specific scenes or anything like that. We were kind of asking them about a club that they maybe went to once or twice over. So really, we got most of the, we got the best stories from just the people that went there and right. the people that worked there. Yeah. And that's, you know, we got, I, you know, we got through a halfway point, I think, where we were saying, you know what, uh, what like one of our famous, uh, what do you call it, white whales was Danzig. And it's like, oh, we got to get Danzig, of course. It's like, and the more we did the book, it's like, you know what, it's kind of better that he's not in it. Because all the, like Dave Brock, you know, rest in peace, God love him. <laughs> told one of the funniest stories I've ever heard about Danzig and Danzig's girlfriend at the time. I, I, I don't think if Glenn Danzig had appeared in that book that that story would have made it in, let's just say. Right. So <laughs> there, are, there are things that we learned, like, yo, man, you, you talk to the people that were there because they're the ones that connected emotionally yeah. with, with that band and with that show. They're the ones that are, that are gonna say, oh, it was the best night of my life because this, 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 and this happened, you know? And nine of those, nine out of 10 of those things might not even have anything to do with the band or the music. It might've just been the greatest night of their life. And, uh, you know, I like those kinds of stories. So we tried to get a little bit of that in too. And then of course, bartenders and bouncers, best stories, hands down. Yeah, Always yeah. have the best. And you, and you have that one, you know, and there is, you know, where you do talk a lot about them, you know, um, you talk about the people, the, the, some of the regulars that went there and you, you, you paid like a homage to them. That's great. Um, and I think it's, again, what made, what makes that book so more um, a personal, you know, was, you know, now for people who've never been there and never got to experience it. I mean, I would love to find out what their takes on it because they probably have a different scene. It, well, I mean, the interesting thing when we were doing the uh, the signings and stuff for this book was we had people who bought it who never went to City Gardens, and they said, you know, I'm from, pick a play, Akron, Ohio, and we had a City Gardens type scene there. Right. Uh, you know, I lived in, 
Atlanta, Georgia, and we had a city gardens type club. Yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people told us about like Fender's Ballroom in California, yeah, sure. or or they compared it. You know, I, I oh, uh, what's that place out in the Midwest in Canada? The Outhouse. They could they kind of compared it to that. Like I, you know, I never been to New Jersey in my life, but yeah. this is where I grew up, and we had this scene, and it was just the same kind. <laughs> So I think that was one of the, the lucky things that we didn't even count on. It just people like who had never been there kind of grabbed onto. Yeah, and really the younger cool. kids too. We had a lot of young people who were like, you know, I, I know that I am never going to experience this because, you know, times have changed. But yeah. I, just, I was there. I wish I could have experienced this. And, but then this book makes me feel like, you know, I, I'm there. So Yeah. And you know, what's kind of funny too is that all kind of leads into why Amy and I have a publishing company in the first place. One of the things when we were, you know, we didn't know what we were going to do once we had a book, like who's going to publish it. We <laughs> yeah. spoke to people and this, that. And one, one of the fav favorite comments that me and Amy heard that we love to bandy about as a joke, you know, 10 years after is, it's a book about New Jersey. You have to make it sexier. You have to make it sexy. <laughs> and we're like, dude, Really? And he meant, by that he meant, oh, big stars and, right. oh, Green Day's in it. Oh, well, you have to interview. I don't want to fucking interview Green Day. I want to just talk about punk rock shows that all my friends went to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people kept telling us dumb shit like that. And that's what led us to being like, you know what? Let's screw it. Like, let's, we, yeah, we wrote it like, ourselves. Unless, I mean, people were saying, unless somebody actually went to City Gardens, why would they read this book? You know, they, right. they're appealing to, you know, uh, 200 people. Like, why would right. they care? Um, and so, I, I mean, we tried to get a publishing deal and it was like, yeah, it's not sexy enough. And can you change the name? It's too long. And can you do this? And, can, and, and finally, Steve and I were like, you know what? No. Yeah. So this was the era of like the, the halcyon days of Kickstarter. We're like, yeah. we'll just do a Kickstarter. And that's exactly what we did. And that was the beginning of our publishing empire such as it is that uh, <laughs> empire <laughs> Ooh, i feel like i got something so, up to i didn't mean to break you away from your golf time i'm sorry <laughs> yeah. Yeah. excuse me i know you're at your club right now so. yeah. no, I, I i can appreciate not not uh not bending on your creative freedoms right so a lot of you see like when bands go on uh, Saturday Night Live and they're told like, you know, the doors and all those, you know, change this lyric and stuff. Yeah. Uh, Kiss did a, a New Year's Eve show over in Dubai and they were told, you know, no blood, you had to change. Uh, they couldn't say the word virgin, uh, you know, all these types of things. And I get yeah. it, you need to at times, but, you know, I, I can appreciate you guys not bending on that because, you know. And it wasn't even like a whole... You know, there wasn't this like, oh my God, should we sell out? It's like, I, I always liken it to this. And a, and, a, and a lot of my attitudes and philosophies come from Ian McKay and, and things that he said and done in the past. And it being like, look, and you can adapt this to the publishing industry, but he's basically like, look, the, the music industry exists and they're very good at what they do and what they sell and the products that they make for the purpose that they serve. We are nothing like that. We're doing a whole different thing. And it's the same thing with books. Like that's, that's, dude, I couldn't even tell you how the real world publishing world works. I have no idea. I don't care. Like, I, you know, oh, you have to do your market research and, and this book will sell. Nah, dude, a good book's going to sell to people who like good books. And so with me and Amy, there was never this whole like, oh, what do we do? What do we, well, we do what we've always done. When people won't give us shows, we make shows. When people won't cover our music, we make our own zines and magazines. So are you guys familiar with a book called Hell on Wheels by Greg Jacobs? Mm, I'm not, uh, no. Uh, Greg Jacobs was a, a, a photographer and a band manager for uh, Big Drill Car. Oh, okay. And, uh, Rocket from the Crypt. Oh, okay. And uh, I interviewed him about two years ago. He had, he had a book called Hell on Wheels, and he just did tour stories. Just interviewed Oh, yeah. Him. And it was just like, you know, small little clippets of, of tour stories. Real funny yep. stories. Yeah, it's been out I've of you, but he just, I just spoke to him a couple of weeks ago uh, through Facebook. They're republishing the book. Oh, cool. Yeah, so it's coming out again. And I think he's going to add more stories to it, he said. Oh, that's cool. Also, yeah. That's so, cool. Uh, yeah. Version. I've actually, I've, I've been kind of on the search for the right person to write a, and the right, from the right band to write a, a just 
completely tour stories, nothing else, just just war stories, you know, funny. Sh- and I have someone in mind, and they'd be great for it. Right. I don't want to put him on the spot, right. but he knows because I keep telling him every time he writes a funny story on Facebook. But I think those are the greatest kind of books, man. Just the the wackiness of the road. Oh, I'm yeah. All for it. Oh, yeah. I love that. That's why I love that book. It's it's a short book. It's it's not a big book, so. <laughs> You know, I gotta, uh, I gotta check have, that one out. Yeah, yeah. Hell on Wheels, it's called. If you nice. can find it, yeah. So nice. To, um, to jump on the the coattails you were talking about, you know, uh, stories and whatnot. Um, of all the interviews that you guys did, d- d- double double question here. So who was, you know, who were the better interviews? Like who was more forthright, more open? And then I'm not gonna put you on the spot and say who was the worst, but who. <laughs> If you want to tell us, by all means, you know. Who who was maybe a little more difficult to work with, if you will? (laughs) Well, I know for me, um, a couple people come to mind. Henry Rollins, because he was the first person who was like a big name who agreed to talk to me. Mm. So I will always uh, be thankful to him for that. Yeah, much love for Henry. Much, a lot of love for Henry. But this was Steve and I together did this interview with with Guar. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Literally in tears, I was. We spent a day with War. (laughs) I was crying. I was laughing so hard. Yeah. Um, We um we were both in Philly, and and I think they had they had a show that night. Okay. And they told us to come down to where was it the Electric Factory? Yeah, it was the Electric Factory. They were going to play that night, and so they told us come down and. It was just Brocky and what they call their historian, uh, Bob Bob Foreman, is that his name, Amy? And it was the two of them. And I think we spent, you know, a good five, six hours with them. And, oh, my God, I never laughed so hard. And I got to yell at Dave because I had a a bone to pick with him from 1988. First time I was taken to see Guar, I was kind of tricked into seeing Guar. (laughs) And I had just bought an awesomely cool bootleg misfit shirt at Zipperhead <laughs> that day. And it was the one white punk rock shirt that I owned. It was a white shirt with the evil live John on the front. That's and tough. my buddy said, yo, Guar is at Revival tonight with Serial Killers. Come with it. I, mean, I don't know who Guar is, but I love the Serial Killers. Or whatever. It was like $3. Go in. And my buddy is like, you got to come up front. And I was like, well, I don't go up front. I'm in the pit. Like, real men are in the pit. He's like, nah, nah, nah. Guar, trust me, go right up front, <laughs> right on the edge of the stage. First song done. I, mean, I was so mad. I tried to get out, but we were so packed in, I couldn't leave. So I got to yell at Dave Rocky for that. And he said, "Sorry, dude." I brought my uh, cool. I brought my daughters to uh, to Warp Tour a couple of years ago, uh, and they didn't know who Guar was either. So I brought them right up front, and when they were done. They just had red and blue all over yep. them. They gave me yep. a hug. They gave me a hug and said, "Dad, that was the greatest show ever." <laughs> See, so, I did not feel that good way, point, man. It was yep. so good. It was so yeah, good. you had a different experience. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but those guys, that was a great interview. A lot of the people that I talked to, uh, especially like a lot of the New York hardcore guys, they were so great yeah. and so generous with their time. Like. Oh, God, half the guys from Token Entry, the guys from Killing Time. I mean, they're all great people to begin with. That's what makes that scene really great is a lot of the people in it are super genuine. But to go above and beyond to to spend like two hours on the phone with some jerk off like me talking about shit that happened 20 (laughs) years ago. Like, you know, I that that kind of stuff means and the best interview, the two best interviews that I personally did. Um, number one, the most, all right, no, I got to say three. The, the most informative and helpful was obviously the right Reverend James F. Norton, Mr. Norton, yep. the uh, stage manager extraordinaire of City Gardens, was fantastic for, for detail, for high comedy, and really great for behind the scenes of what went on. It's shit I would never have guessed that happened. It was really, really cool stories. Dave Vision, God rest his soul, one of the best people I've known in my life. He spent uh, six hours on the phone with me between like two days telling me every story of every show he went to there, every show he played there, every show that his friends, anything he could think of, he gave to me. And what was the third one? Oh, the third one, of course, was Mr. Steve Brown. Mm -hmm. Best interview I did. 
<laughs> laughing like a maniac, just recounting these psychotic episodes yeah, psychotic of violence. Episodes. Yes. yes. Half of them we didn't put in the book because they were just too much. I didn't want to incriminate them, first of all. <laughs> but just the sheer joy at random, dumb adolescent male violence. And I, God bless them. I, it was, I loved it. I was equally amused and horrified at every time. <laughs> You're going to get well, a- and, and one of the reasons City Gardens had to close was the insurance for every yeah. event it was skyrocketed because of people doing stuff like Steve Brown. Right. And so I remember like uh, in the documentary that uh, Steve came out right out and asked him, like, do you feel responsible for the club closing because of some of your antics? And then, you know, that and he's basically like, nope. <laughs> None of us do. No. Because we all acted like jackasses. Yeah, yeah you know? absolutely, absolutely. Some, you know, got into heavier stuff. Yeah. You know, it's, <laughs> hey, man, it, it's not a perfect scene. It never was. You know, I, I remember I was at a, a Ramon show there, and it was really hot. My God, that place oh my God, just yeah. turned into a yeah. furnace real quick. I wasn't really drinking. Uh, and I think I drove by myself, and I met friends there, and... Uh, I ended up like heat exhaustion. I went behind the speakers by the steps to the back, to the up, threw up all behind the speakers, and then I went right back out in the pit. <laughs> <laughs> yep. How I survived that night, I don't know, man. I was like, it was, I just had a sick feeling. It was so hot in there. I did the uh, same thing at uh, Bad Brains at Revival uh, 89. It was such a tight, it was the hottest show I've ever been to. I think it was, there was a, a Bad Brains agnostic front show. And no, it was it was the same Bad Brains Leeway show. It was the same tour. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah. That was really hot. I remember they had the, they had all the doors open. Yeah. Because it was yeah. just it was I like, think I think uh, the air conditioner blew out or something like that. Is that what it, yeah, I remember that show being disgustingly hot. I think Yeah, I, it was a, I can't remember the, the Philly revival show was either like the night before or the right. night after. We went to both. And yeah. both were equally hot in their own separate ways. City Gardens, because it was like three times the size of Revival, but Revival yeah. because it was so small. But yeah, I had a buddy who passed out. I got so sick and I went, and I don't even drink. I'm never going to drink. I went right out the door, right back in. <laughs> yeah. I, I know. Hey. Uh, I think, I think I probably left that show dressed as Henry. I just, yeah. had, just like Your little shorts. Yeah. Little, little shorts. Like, but I, my, my clothes were just beyond. So, you know, yeah. I used to, you know, I started out as a metalhead. I'm, I'm a straight, like, you know, I would I went and saw Slayer in like '85 at a tiny little club here in Philly in the Northeast, and that was a place I went to for years before I even found hardcore shows. And that place was was a meat fat. They would do Sunday every other night they were open. You know, it was it was the place where Cinderella got. So it was all that hair and glam metal. Yeah. But they started doing uh, Sunday night all ages thrash shows. And they they were they had some really dope band you know that's where we saw Sonic Frost the first time I oh, yeah. uh, can't even remember but that was one of the most overheated packed places I've ever oh, been yeah at. yeah that that show will live in memory because I, I don't remember ever being that hot before in my life yeah you know I, I would love it when you would go to a show it would be winter it would be freezing out you would go into a show it was like you said a furnace. <laughs> The show would end, they would fling the doors open, you would go out, and everyone would just have steam. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just steam coming off of you. Yeah. It's like when you watch a football game and they come out of the tunnel yeah. and they have all the smoke. To, that's exactly. what it was, like. it was like. Yeah, it was like do it yourself, dry ice or fog. Yeah. And then within, within 30 <laughs> seconds of getting outside, everyone's like, oh my God, I'm dying. It's so cool. yeah. You know, Back people are just running to their cars, you know. You yeah, it would feel to, good for like. Then you'd have to wait. You'd have to wait for the stupid soccer games to end. Freaking people would be done over there in the field. Leave us the hell alone. I'm just yeah. to get away from my car. Stop breaking bottles over here. That was another weird factor about City yeah. Gardens. Like, what, what other punk club did you go to that had a soccer field out front? <laughs> uh, my my father in law is an ex Trenton uh, police officer. Oh wow! So he has many. Tales of City Gardens. <laughs> I'm sure He's a he does. police officer from where? From Trenton. Oh wow! Yeah, and he well, that, during the eighties he was he was a police officer. During well, the that 80s. was always the in thing. The, apparently, City Gardens was right on the edge of Trenton and Lawrenceville. Yes, Trenton and Ewing. Yeah. And so when the, somebody would call the police, the police would apparently 
argue about which who's going um, yeah who's going and so a lot of times they would decide no one's going yeah <laughs> yeah and it was it it was a very interesting place to say the least and, and yeah. it was and it was you know the, yeah they'll never i don't think there'll ever be anything like it again and, nah. you know, mm -hmm. but th thank you for that book you know we appreciate that um let's talk about the hard times anthology i didn't i apologize i didn't really get to see it yet so okay is it more of a collection of the articles that were, were put together? It's just a straight anthology um, of the zine that I did uh, with Ron Gregorio. <clears throat> he started it. I came in on like issue two or three. Uh, it's basically just all the issues reproduced. Uh, we modeled the book on the, if you're, if you're familiar with the Touch and Go anthology. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so we reproduced the issues, you know, exactly as they were, typos and all. Right. Um, <laughs> We recreated the last issue, number eight, that never got to come out because we ran out of money. Uh, we did some interviews interspersed, uh, mostly with Ron, just to set up what it was like. And then at the end, Ron did a lot of photography. Uh, so we put a lot of his photos in there at the end in okay. color. You know, Black Flag, The Descendants. Uh, he has some great um, Sam Hain. Sam Hain playing like a rec center, a uh, black guy <laughs> playing, playing a roller rink. Wow. There's he's a lot of great shots from City Gardens, too. A lot of yeah, like uh, Husker Du and Minutemen shots. Yeah. Oh, really? They were taken straight from City Gardens. And the thing is, these bands, what people don't seem to realize now, especially younger people, okay, these bands are legendary now. Yeah. Back then, no one gave a shit. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. tell you, yep. Black Flag played a roller rink, and if there was 200 people there, there were a lot. Yep. Yeah, you know yep. the descendants would play. Sometimes to the play, it was be it would be half empty. Yeah, we had um, uh, we had Doug Carry on on with us a couple times, and he was talking about, you know, it was no joke, man. It was times where we just got into a club and there was like twenty people. Yeah, yeah, you know? and we had traveled hours to get there. You know, and it was yeah. People don't realize that this music, yeah, it, it means a lot to us, but. You know, then it was like they didn't know if it was going to sell. They didn't no. know if it was going to happen with it. And that didn't stop anybody. No. Nobody cared. It just kept going. You know? yeah. I mean, they were so ahead of their time that they that you really had to be a certain type of person to have that music appeal to you and want to make the journey to go out and take whatever risks were involved to go see them live. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, there was one show that I just, just brought to mention. I just thought about this, that it was, I think it was, Descendants, Agent Orange, Volcano Dag Sons. Dag Nasty. Dag Nasty, Dag, Volcano but Dag Nasty didn't show up. Right. I think they played CBs in the daytime or something and they missed it. I don't remember the story, but I know I know they didn't play it. Yeah, they, 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 they missed the show. It. I remember, yeah, they, they missed that show. I, I, yeah, I thought about that. So anyway. Well, but um, fans would try to pack a lot of, a lot of so many shows and it's such a, short space of time to get the money. So yeah, you would yeah. drive down to CBs and you would drive down to City Gardens and the next day you would do Philly and then the next day you would do DC. So, I mean, they were like, it was like a tour of duty. I mean, they- yeah, were, this, this, cor this, this corridor of the East Coast, you could do that because you can go play 930, you can come yeah. up to City Gardens, you can go play CBs, you, yep. you, know, you can go to Max's, you, can, you know, so many different places you can go at that time to play. But that's that's you know, what I loved about living in Philly. You were right. kind of like within spitting distance of, you know, the, the, an hour the best and a half, venues. Right, an hour and a half, yeah. you're basically anywhere. Yeah. And if you wanted to make a, a long road trip, you drove up to Boston. Right, exactly. Yeah. 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 It, was, it was a great, that whole section, I think, was just really good time, you know, for those bands to be able to utilize and not have to travel so much and still... Yep. You know, make it to each next town. You know, we got we're, we're real lucky. You know, as far as time and location, like the, the yeah. timing that we are we're around, the timing of this music to come into our lives, and the way you know wasn't the most accessible thing. But you know, we felt. I think that's kind of like the trial by fire. That's why you stick with the people that you became friends with through this, because we all had to go through some kind of like. Every one of us has some horrible high school story about being picked off for being you know a freak or a weirdo. <laughs> I'm glad you said it. I didn't want to have to. Do it. 
But seriously, every one of us, we went, there was some kind of effort you had to put into being a music lover. Yeah. So it meant more to you. It, the friendships yeah. meant more to you. The music meant more to you. When you wrote a letter to a band that you love, you got a letter back. Yeah. Mostly always from somebody in that band. Yeah. So like, who does that now? Yeah. Yeah. So now, now it's, 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 it's difficult to get even any, even with the internet. Yeah. You know, you reach out to certain people and just, you don't know, response. Like if you, yeah, plus, if you ping somebody on Facebook, like you said, who the hell knows who's replying? Is it their, uh, their yeah. AR guy or, you know, right, VR exactly. or someone's girlfriend? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> who knows how authentic yeah. it is. So. Yeah. yeah. So um, now you have a new book that you guys are publishing coming out, the Scrabble book. When it, Fourth of July, yeah, that's uh, Mark Wasserman, a Jersey native, a uh, City Gardens alumnus, a longtime purveyor of fine ska music throughout several bands of his history. Right. He uh, he got the crazy idea in his head a couple of years back that he wanted to write an oral history. Okay. <laughs> and as much as we tried to discourage him, he still <laughs> wanted to do it. <laughs> Um, no, Mark's a great guy. Mark has been working on this book for uh, just about three years now. Okay. Yeah. Um, he's a dedicated ska lover uh, uh, and historian, obviously. And he's, you know, he just, he's one of us. He's a music guy who has a great love for this scene. Now, for me, I, I was the one that he approached initially about it. Now, for me, I'm not the world's biggest ska fan. I don't hate it. I know the long, rich tradition of it, and I love the two-tone stuff. I, other than the toasters, honestly, I didn't know anything about American ska. Right, okay. But with Amy and I, you know, our dedication is to subculture and to kind of giving voice to so, scenes that maybe, you know, wouldn't otherwise, you know, be preserved for history or, yeah. you know, for whatever reason, we don't care. We don't look at the long range. We look at the Oh, that's a cool idea. Let's do it. Uh, having no, you know, Mark was a great help with the, with no slam dancing. I interviewed him a bunch of times, and he was one of the few ska people that we were able to get in touch with. So he gave us, you know, all that kind of background stuff for our book, and it just seemed like you know a natural progression. Me and Amy have a real strong feeling about working with people that we know and are sort of like family to us, so that it was great that he fell into that. And he basically spent two years tracking down these people that basically did the same thing as any other music scene that popped up in the same kind of time span. They, they heard something, they loved something, whether it was the, the reggae coming out of Jamaica, the two-tone from, from the UK, whatever, they wanted to do it themselves. And when no one was interested in what they were doing, they created their own circuit, you know? And you have stories of like, Oh, I remember seeing the specials on Saturday Night Live in 1980, and that's the touchstone, just like every other scene. And he managed to capture some really great stories, some really cool history about a really cool scene, and it just it just worked out great. And so we put we put the finishing touches on it. It's just about to go to print very soon, and has a July 4th release date. Anything else in the works? So I that. We have the SST book, okay. correct? Okay. Um, we're working with Abe Gibson, who Amy, you should probably tell this because you 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 know this one better than I. I haven't gotten to this one yet. Yeah, uh, it's his name is Abe Gibson. He's been working on this book. You know, it's an oral history uh, about the history of SST records. Awesome. He, he had a goal of trying to talk to at least one person who from every band. Right. That was on SST, and I think he's close. Wow. Um, and uh, he's he's working to wrap it up now, and so that's probably going to come out next year. Um, <clears throat> so there's that one. We also have and the great matter one that Steve is working on. Yeah, my uh, my big coup for this week. Um, it's really random too. So a, a guy that I sort of grew up with um, here in Delco. But I was never, like, really close friends. We all had the same circle of friends. I knew him as a good dude, but, like, me and him never hung out one-on-one -on -one or anything like that. But we're friendly, connected on social media, sends me a message 
uh, about a week or two ago. Hey, a buddy of mine, he's in a bunch of punk rock bands and he's got all this like, you know, all these old flyers from shows and great photos. And I think he's looking to do a book. You know, is it cool if I give him your, I'm like, oh yeah, sure. What's his name? And he tells me his name is Mark and the band that he played in was Gray Matter from, from Washington, yeah, D.C. Yeah, who sure. kind of rose out of Iron Cross. If, if you have, you know, if you don't know D.C. punk rock history, um, you know, came out on Discord. Um, sort of very well known, but outside of us, not hugely well known but a band that i grew up absolutely loving and it was just such a weird sort of how does this guy that i grew up with know this guy in this band that i loved for years so he put us in touch i started talking with him and he brought in one of the other guys and we were kicking it back and forth and sort of came up with this idea of all four members of the band have all been together since they were very young and they've stayed friends. There's never been a different member in Gray Matter. It's always been the same four members. And so our kind of idea was, well, then all four of you should write the book. And that's that's kind of what they're going to do. Cool. Awesome. So it's just it's just starting now. That was way down the road. But I'm real, I'm real excited about working with them and doing the whole process. So that's cool. We have a couple other things that we I don't think we should we can all really right. throw out there yet. All right. Leave oh, some surprises. Yeah. But I will tell you this. We are venturing over into the world of metal. If everything oh, John will be happy about that. Yeah, yeah dude. And, and you are going to like it. So then, Stephen, I'll, I'll contact you once you get into that project. And I'll Absolutely. bring you on the show. There we go. There go. All right. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> well, guys, listen, thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having Keep us up on. The good work. You know, and thank you thank our, our mutual friend Pete for putting us in touch. Yes, thank you, Pete. Yes, thank yeah. you, Pete. Yes, thank you, Pete. Yes. And uh, definitely, uh, we'll talk again in the future. You know, when you have something coming up, we'd love to hear about it. So uh, awesome, we'll talk again. All right, thanks, All right. guys. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank, thank you, guys. Bye bye. Appreciate it. Bye bye.